Judges chapter 1. After the death of Joshua, the Israelites asked the Lord, Which of our tribes should attack the Canaanites first? Judah, the Lord answered. I'll help them take the land. The people of Judah went to their relatives, the Simeon tribe, and said, Canaanites live in the land God gave us. Help us fight them, and we will help you. Troops from Simeon came to help Judah. Together, they attacked an army of 10,000 Canaanites and Perizzites at Bezek, and the Lord helped Judah defeat them. During the battle, Judah's army found out where the king of Bezek was, and they attacked there. Bezek tried to escape, but soldiers from Judah caught him. They cut off his thumbs and big toes, and he said, I've cut off the thumbs and big toes of 70 kings and made those kings crawl around under my table for scraps of food. Now God is paying me back. The army of Judah took the king of Bezek along with them to Jerusalem, where he died. They attacked Jerusalem, captured it, killed everyone who lived there, and then burned it to the ground. Judah's army fought the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, the southern desert, and the foothills to the west. After that, they attacked the Canaanites who lived at Hebron, defeating the three clans called Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai. At that time, Hebron was called Kiriath Arba. From Hebron, Judah's army went to attack Deber, which at that time was called Kiriath Sefer. Caleb told his troops, The man who captures Kiriath Sefer can marry my daughter Aksa. Caleb's nephew, Othniel, captured Kiriath Sefer, so Caleb let him marry Aksa. Othniel was the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. Right after the wedding, Aksa started telling Othniel that he ought to ask her father for a field. She went to see her father, and while she was getting down from her donkey, Caleb asked, What's bothering you? She answered, I need your help. The land you gave me is in the southern desert. So please give me some spring-fed ponds for a water supply. Caleb gave her a couple of small ponds, named Higher Pond and Lower Pond. The people who belonged to the Kenite clan were the descendants of the father-in-law of Moses. They left Jericho with the people of Judah and settled near Arad in the southern desert of Judah, not far from the Amalekites. Judah's army helped Simeon's army attack the Canaanites, who lived at Zephath. They completely destroyed the town and renamed it Horma. The Lord helped the army of Judah capture Gaza, Ashkelon, Ekron, and the land near those towns. They also took the hill country. But the people who lived in the valleys had iron chariots, so Judah was not able to make them leave or to take their land. The tribe of Judah gave the town of Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had told them to do. Caleb defeated the three Anakim clans and took over the town. The Jebusites were living in Jerusalem, and the Benjamin tribe did not defeat them or capture the town. That's why Jebusites still live in Jerusalem along with the people of Benjamin. The Ephraim and Manasseh tribes were getting ready to attack Bethel, which at that time was called Luz. And the Lord helped them when they sent spies to find out as much as they could about Bethel. While the spies were watching the town, a man came out and told them, If you show us how our army can get into the town, we'll make sure that you aren't harmed. The man showed them, and the two Israelite tribes attacked Bethel, killing everyone except the man and his family. The two tribes made the man and his family leave, so they went to the land of the Hittites, where he built a town. He named the town Luz, and that is still its name. Canaanites lived in the towns of Bethshean, Taanak, Dor, Iblium, Megiddo, and all the villages nearby. The Canaanites were determined to stay, and the Manasseh tribe never did get rid of them. But later on, when the Israelites grew more powerful, they made slaves of the Canaanites. The Ephraim tribe did not get rid of the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites lived there with the Israelites all around them. The Zebulun tribe did not get rid of the Canaanites who lived in Kitron and Nahalal, and the Canaanites stayed there with Israelites around them. But the people of Zebulun did force the Canaanites into slave labor. The Asher tribe did not get rid of the Canaanites who lived in Akko, Sidon, Alab, Aksib, Helba, Aphek, and Rehob, and the Asher tribe lived with Canaanites all around them. The Naphtali tribe did not get rid of the Canaanites who lived in Beth Shemesh and Beth Anath, 
but they did force the Canaanites into slave labor. The Naphtali tribe lived with Canaanites around them. The Amorites were strong enough to keep the tribe of Dan from settling in the valleys, so Dan had to stay in the hill country. The Amorites on Mount Heras and in Ajalon and Shalbim were also determined to stay. Later on, as Ephraim and Manasseh grew more powerful, they forced those Amorites into slave labor. The old Amorite-Edomite border used to go from Selah through Scorpion Pass into the hill country. Judges chapter 2 The Lord's angel went from Gilgal to Bochim and gave the Israelites this message from the Lord. I promised your ancestors that I would give this land to their families, and I brought your people here from Egypt. We made an agreement that I promised never to break, and you promised not to make any peace treaties with the other nations that live in the land. Besides that, you agreed to tear down the altars where they sacrificed to their idols, but you didn't keep your promise. And so, I'll stop helping you defeat your enemies. Instead, they will be there to trap you into worshipping their idols. The Israelites started crying loudly, and they offered sacrifices to the Lord. From then on, they called that place crying. Joshua had been faithful to the Lord, and after Joshua sent the Israelites to take the land they had been promised, they remained faithful to the Lord until Joshua died at the age of 110. He was buried on his land in timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gaash. Even though Joshua was gone, the Israelites were faithful to the Lord during the lifetime of those men who had been leaders with Joshua and who had seen the wonderful things the Lord had done for Israel. After a while, the people of Joshua's generation died, and the next generation did not know the Lord or any of the things he had done for Israel. The Lord had brought their ancestors out of Egypt, and they had worshipped him. But now the Israelites stopped worshipping the Lord and worshipped the idols of Baal and Astarte, as well as the idols of other gods from nearby nations. The Lord was so angry at the Israelites that he let other nations raid Israel and steal their crops and other possessions. Enemies were everywhere, and the Lord always let them defeat Israel in battle. The Lord had warned Israel he would do this, and now the Israelites were miserable. From time to time, the Lord would choose special leaders known as judges. These judges would lead the Israelites into battle and defeat the enemies that made raids on them. In years gone by, the Israelites had been faithful to the Lord, but now they were quick to be unfaithful and to refuse even to listen to these judges. The Israelites would disobey the Lord, and instead of worshiping Him, they would worship other gods. When enemies made life miserable for the Israelites, the Lord would feel sorry for them. He would choose a judge and help that judge rescue Israel from its enemies. The Lord would be kind to Israel as long as that judge lived. But afterwards, the Israelites would become even more sinful than their ancestors had been. The Israelites were stubborn. They simply would not stop worshiping other gods or following the teachings of other religions. The Lord was angry with Israel and said, The Israelites have broken the agreement I made with their ancestors. They won't obey me, so I'll stop helping them defeat their enemies. Israel still had a lot of enemies when Joshua died, and I'm going to let those enemies stay. I'll use them to test Israel, because then I can find out if Israel will worship and obey me as their ancestors did. That's why the Lord had not let Joshua get rid of all those enemy nations right away. Judges chapter 3 And the Lord had another reason for letting these enemies stay. The Israelites needed to learn how to fight in war just as their ancestors had done. Each new generation would have to learn by fighting the Philistines and their five rulers, as well as the Canaanites, the Sidonians, and the Hivites that lived in the Lebanon mountains from Mount Baal Hermon to Hamath Pass. Moses had told the Israelites what the Lord had commanded them to do, and now the Lord was using these nations to find out if Israel would obey. But they refused. And it was because of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites who lived all around them. Some of the Israelites married the people of these nations, and that's how they started worshipping foreign gods. 
The Israelites sinned against the Lord by forgetting him and worshiping idols of Baal and Astarte. This made the Lord angry, so he let Israel be defeated by King Kushan Rishathaim of northern Syria, who ruled Israel eight years and made everyone pay taxes. The Israelites begged the Lord for help, and he chose Othniel to rescue them. Othniel was the son of Caleb's younger brother, Kenaz. The Spirit of the Lord took control of Othniel, and he led Israel in a war against Kushan Rishathaim. The Lord gave Othniel victory, and Israel was at peace until Othniel died about 40 years later. Once more, the Israelites started disobeying the Lord. So he let them be defeated by King Eglon of Moab, who had joined forces with the Ammonites and the Amalekites to attack Israel. Eglon and his army captured Jericho. Then he ruled Israel for 18 years and forced the Israelites to pay heavy taxes. The Israelites begged the Lord for help, and the Lord chose Ehud from the Benjamin tribe to rescue them. They put Ehud in charge of taking the taxes to King Eglon. But before Ehud went, he made a double-edged dagger. Ehud was left-handed, so he strapped the dagger to his right thigh, where it would be hidden under his robes. Ehud and some other Israelites took the taxes to Eglon, who was a very fat man. As soon as they gave the taxes to Eglon, Ehud said it was time to go home. Ehud went with the other Israelites as far as the statues at Gilgal. Then he turned back and went upstairs to the cool room where Eglon had his throne. Ehud said, Your Majesty, I need to talk with you in private. Eglon replied, Don't say anything yet. His officials left the room, and Eglon stood up as Ehud came closer. Yes, Ehud said. I have a message for you from God. Ehud pulled out the dagger with his left hand and shoved it so far into Eglon's stomach that even the handle was buried in his fat. Ehud left the dagger there. Then, after closing and locking the doors to the room, he climbed through a window onto the porch and left. When the king's officials came back and saw that the doors were locked, they said, The king is probably inside relieving himself. They stood there waiting until they felt foolish, but Eglon never opened the doors. Finally, they unlocked the doors and found King Eglon lying dead on the floor. But by that time, Ehud had already escaped past the statues. Ehud went to the town of Sira in the hill country of Ephraim and started blowing a signal on a trumpet. The Israelites came together and he shouted, Follow me! The Lord will help us defeat the Moabites! The Israelites followed Ehud down to the Jordan Valley, and they captured the places where people crossed the river on the way to Moab. They would not let anyone go across, and before the fighting was over, they killed about 10,000 Moabite warriors. Not one escaped alive. Moab was so badly defeated that it was a long time before they were strong enough to attack Israel again. And Israel was at peace for 80 years. Shamgar, the son of Anath, was the next to rescue Israel. In one battle, he used a sharp wooden pole to kill 600 Philistines.